Would you spend the next minute or two in fervent personal prayer that God by his spirit will come and give you and then everyone else, pray that prayer for everyone else, the kind of revelation that we desperately need tonight on the word of God. Let's go to prayer silently, fervently. God will hear us to the degree we see our desperate need for revelation of truth and our desire for it and our willingness to obey it. According to those three things and then fourthly, our faith to believe he will. Humility to see the need, desperate prayer for it to happen, faith to believe that he will, and an obedient will to obey. He will if we fulfill those conditions. Just silently. Thank you, Father, that we have prayed prayers that are according to your will when we've asked for revelation of truth in order that we may see it, in order that we may understand you, in order that we may obey you. And we know that you're longing to answer that prayer. I pray, dear God, that the revelation of truth will match the need of the hour for our eyes to have the scales removed, our ears to be unstopped, and our hearts and spirits, spirit to be... Uh, quickened and energized by the Holy Spirit to act upon what our wills decide that our minds have received from you and our hearts have been stirred to, uh, to motivate us to act. Thank you that you will do your part. We look to you and I pray for the authority to speak to match the need of the hour. Thank you that you will. In Jesus' name, amen. When Lauren called me up on the very first morning, I think it was last Thursday morning, our opening session, and he was speaking, and you remember he said, would I come forward and give the guidance that God had given me to come to this time, this two weeks workshop, and I did. And I gave you... Um, and some of you wrote them down, the scriptures that God had given me in relation to the direction to come. Now, do you remember that I said that I had no understanding at all at the time he gave them to me as to why he was giving me those scriptures? I noticed that they were all related to leaders calling leaders together. Do you remember that? And I just held those scriptures before God, wondering who they were for. Now, there were three other scriptures that God gave me in relation to Abigail, making haste to go and give the word of the Lord to David. There was Deborah, uniting with Barak, leading the leaders into the battle. And the third one was Huldah the prophetess, linked with Josiah the king in God's purposes, uh, which resulted in the leader calling the leaders together again. I understood from the last three references very clearly in relation to um, the ministry that God has entrusted me with in relation to Youth with a Mission. But I had no understanding of those other verses that spoke of Joshua, uh, Asa, and uh, Josiah calling the people together, and Solomon. And it was only when I was in a time of prayer in relation to this conference and calling out to God for him to move in, in power and uh, authority amongst us and bring revelation of truth, that the, in the midst of that prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit spoke into my mind and and showed me that I was to go to the Word at the first opportunity after the prayer meeting I was in and look into the purpose as to why the leaders called, those leaders called leaders together. 
And as I did that, then he poured a message into me and showed me very clearly that this was to be given at this time. And so uh, this is a very tailor-made word for this specific conference. Uh, I may never give this message again. I suspect I won't necessarily because it was what God was saying to me were the purposes of why he had called us together as a group. And remember, I wasn't asking for a message. I was merely asking, was I to come? And he in his sovereignty chose to speak in this way. So it must be tremendously important what he has to say to us if he has sovereignly chosen to say that these are some of the main purposes that he has brought us together. So the title of the message, I can't give it any other message than some of God's purposes for calling us as leaders together in Youth with a Mission at this time. What else could I call it? Joshua chapter 23 verses 1 to 2. I tell you that background so that you will listen with that kind of intensity that is needed for you to hear the purpose, one of the, some of the main purposes of why we are here. Not to understand them would be disastrous because we would then not be able to fulfill them. And do you know what would be the most disastrous thing? The greatest tragedy would be the disappointment in the heart of God. Have you noticed, have you pondered, have you thought about the fact that many, many, many times, I would suspect most times, that God's people get together, they can be very fulfilled and think they've had an absolutely wonderful time and go away fulfilled. And often, very often, I ponder whether God has been fulfilled. It really doesn't matter whether we think we are fulfilled. The only thing that matters is whether he is fulfilled. And in the long run, we are only as fulfilled as he is fulfilled. And that's why when we're coming together at any point in time, we should seek God earnestly, all of us, as preparation, and say to God, what is it you're wanting to do? What is on your heart? What are your purposes in our coming together? And seek his face until he stops speaking. Now when we hear what his purposes are, then his program will follow. And we will then see the right ministries that fit his program. Purpose one, because this was the first scripture that he gave me. Joshua chapter 23. I invite you to turn to it, as I will be going very quickly through that chapter. If you don't want to turn to it, I can just give you the verses that you can write down to make reference. Joshua 23, verses 1 to 2. It's the call of the leader to bring the leaders together. And we note with significance that this is the end of Josh, at the end of Joshua's leadership. A very powerful, very successful, very anointed leadership under God. And therefore, it must be very important what this leader was saying as a final deposit to the people that he has, had led throughout the time of his leadership. I would think that at the moment that we knew or as the time was drawing very close to the time that we would die as leaders, and I guess we're in, in some position of leadership by virtue of our position or ministry function in this room tonight, that we would weigh very heavily and carefully and take very seriously what we would say to the people under our ministry or our, under our leadership. If God said, now you're going to be taken to me soon 
and you've poured out your, your life and your heart to these people, now I'm giving you just twice to speak to them. And this is exactly the scenario here. We're going to be looking at the, the, the two last messages that Joshua gave to his leaders. And God wants us to take them as seriously as they must have taken, knowing that uh, their leader was not going to be with them long. Verse 3, the first thing after he had summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am old and well advanced in your year, in years. You yourselves have seen, seen everything the Lord has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Now, right there in verse 3, there is a reminder that God alone is the one who won the battles over their enemies. Now, as I go through this, meeting, this message tonight, God does not want us to sit thinking of the history of the Israelites. They are merely a reference point that he and his sovereignty has chosen for us immediately to relate in our thinking. And he wants us to make application on every point. And so he wants us right now to think of every victory that has been wrought in our ministries, in our leadership. Every victory, every battle against the powers of darkness. It's an enormous list, isn't it? it it's staggering, isn't it? In fact, do you find it happening to you what's happening to me? It's too big to even remember or comprehend. I just have the impression that it's massive. Anybody relate there? And the God is saying to us, I want you to take yourself out of the picture. I want you to take organizations out of the picture. I want to take air, you to take every method, means, personalities, ministries, everything else out of it where there is only me left in your, in your, in your memory. That I and I alone wrought those victories. That's the first thing he's saying to us. There is nothing that I find in the Word of God, no method that God uses more to build faith for the future of what he's asking us to do, then first of all, to look at himself and then to remind us what he has done for us in the past. As we do those two things, faith should immediately rise for anything he tells us to do in the future. And verse 5 says, he's the only one who can win the battles ahead. He, the Lord your God himself will drive them out of your way. He will push them out before you and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God has promised you. Related to exactly where we are in Youth with a Mission now. I've wrought all those impossible battles and brought all those victories that were impossible to you. Any obstacle or any vision or anything that should seem uh, difficult or impose any problem to you, just look to me. I have the solution. I have the power. I have the plans. I have the ability to give them to you. I can solve every problem. I who did it back there to bring you from where you are to where you are now is the one. It's no sweat for me to keep on doing what I've been doing. Now, by now, have we taken all the human element out of it? That's why I'm not saying that he doesn't use humans. That's not what I'm saying. But this is the focus that God wants to bring us to. Are you capturing it? Have you, can you just see that it is God who has and it is God who will? Has faith risen? Thank you. At least someone's awake and listening. I'm glad it's the leader. I know his yes. Verse 6. 
There's a strong exhortation to what? Someone tell me. Yes? And what immediately follows that? To obey. To obey what? The word of God. And then he says, and Lauren again made the, had the right emphasis, all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Now, what is God saying to us as a mission? Our first instruction after looking at him, the reminder of what he's done and what he will do, he says, now listen, be strong to obey. Not just be strong, nebulous. Not just be strong for the sake of it. Be strong and be careful to obey all the word of God. I cannot tell you how strongly God has impressed upon my spirit in preparation for this message to give to you tonight, how strongly he has shown me that we are to make the Bible itself the bottom line, the focus, the center, the slide rule, the basis, the checkpoint of everything that we are considering doing. Everything that we are hearing. We have heard in Youth with a Mission many voices. We shall hear many voices. And God is saying by his Spirit, judge every voice and everything that is said by the slide rule, the plumb line of my word. If it doesn't match my word, if it doesn't match the biblical principles in my word, if it doesn't match the character of the one who wrote the word, throw it out. We have to know the word of God to be able to obey all that is written in it. What place does the word of God take in your life and mine on a daily basis? I'm talking about in a high-powered program like this. I'm talking about the high-powered programs that we find ourselves in every day. Would you or I be ashamed if God spoke with an audible voice or wrote with his finger on a wall or a board, the basis or the, at least the effectiveness of our time alone with God in the word for all to hear, would we be embarrassed or ashamed tonight if every one of the rest of us knew the effectiveness that we had as a way of life in the word of God, what it's been like since we've been here, Embarrassed, ashamed, or not? Friends, we can only obey what we know to do. And when I read that verse, the first time when the Holy Spirit showed me this was to be a message, it was the all that is written that leapt out by the Holy Spirit to me. And immediately I understood what God was saying. We have to read it all. Many, many Christians have never read the Bible cover to cover. Many Christians have no working understanding at all of the word or what the basic thing that God is saying from the books in the Bible. I was appalled to read in some Christian magazine recently, and I've forgotten the percentage of how, but it was a, a poll that was taken and it, the percentage was so low it was shocking and alarming to me of how many Christians read the word of God daily. How many it gave a, a low percentage and a very low percentage of those who've ever read it through. 
How can we obey and be strong and be careful to obey if we don't know what he's saying? How can we have God's perspective if we are not listening to his perspective? There's one place to find it. Friends, if we're not, and listen, if we make our reading matter outside the Bible as our priority of reading matter, what are we going to be influenced more by? The reading matter outside the Bible. When we have God's perspective, it comes from a mind and a heart saturated with the divine viewpoint. It's found in one book. That doesn't mean to say that God doesn't lead us to read other books, but what's the priority of our reading? If you are bored with the Bible, you are bored with the author. Because you cannot separate the Word of God from the author. God, in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the living Word. God breathed upon holy men of God who were inspired by God and wrote. You can't separate God from the Word. When you have a love for God's Word, you will have a love for the author of the book. I will know your relationship with the author by your love for his word. When we, don't, when we don't have an intimate relationship, a love relationship with someone, we don't care whether we hear their voice or not. But when we do, their voice matters to us. It doesn't really matter quite so much what they're saying as long as we can hear them and we know they're talking to us. Because it's the communication of intimacy. When you love God, you love to hear what he has to say. And then you love to obey. Obedience isn't a chore. When it's God who has spoken, what place does the word of God take in your daily life? How much love for him? have you? How much obedience can you manifest? We obey what we know to do. I give you that emphasis because that's how he spoke to me to give it to you. Verse 7, there's a very strong warning not to be involved or influenced by the nations around them. Do you see it there? That's why I hope you have your Bibles open. Do not associate with these na nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. But that first part, as I pondered that and meditated and asked the Holy Spirit to show me what he was saying, and very clearly and very strongly he spoke into my mind. Joy, I want you to tell them to guard against the world's systems. Do you know the subtlest way for us to be influenced by the world systems? Are you listening? It's by having people who come to us with mixtures of truth who come with systems of the world mixed with truth that we need to hear. I can't think of anything more subtle than that. Can you? We need again to listen. Take in humility everything that is of God based upon his word, his principles, his character. But where anything comes out that savors a system of the world, it may sound the fanciest thing to do. It may sound as though it's going to uh, solve a whole lot of problems. They may say it worked somewhere else. But listen, if it's a system of the world that is not based upon God's word, his character, or his ways, 
that can be the most subtle thing that can cause us to imbibe something that God was telling through Joshua not to touch. You see, it's so much more subtle now. We don't necessarily have a flag waving, this is a world system. But there is such a vast majority of what we do, even in our constructive, in our, in our structures, that is coming from a system of the world and not from a biblical perspective. Weigh everything. Is this how the early church did it? Not necessarily the same method, method, methodology or whatever. Methodology, okay. It's the principle. Did they do it this way in principle? A strong warning not to be involved or influenced by this, the systems of the world. Jesus said so strongly, my kingdom is not of this world. There is also a strong warning against idolatry in any form. You must not you, not, you not to invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. And then in verse 11, we are told, skip down to there, will you? So be very careful to love the Lord your God. A strong warning against idolatry and a strong warning in verses 8 and 11, look back at 8. You are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. You are to hold fast to him. All right? Couple it again with 11. I'm, em I'm repeating for emphasis so that we won't miss it. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. What is the opposite of idolatry? Absolute devotion to the Lord. And so there's the strong warning against idolatry sandwiched in between two strong warnings to love God. And then verse 16, we have um, verse 11 at least, the strong a warning to keep a strong devotional life and close relationship with the Lord Jesus. Now let's pause here for a moment. Let's... Let's not just go over this, because it's absolutely crucial to the heart of this message on idolatry. If the opposite of idolatry is devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ, let's stop and ask ourselves some pertinent questions. How devoted are we to the Lord Jesus? What is the to what is the degree, you answer the questions, you don't need to answer them to me, but do answer them to God. What is the degree of your intimacy of friendship with God? Would you want that to be known? You know, it's perfectly possible to be a YWAM leader sitting in this kind of a two-week workshop and feel remote personally to God. Our intimacy of friendship with God is measured by how close we are to him when we're completely alone and there's no fellowship like this at all. Our, fellow, our intimate friend, uh, intimacy of friendship with God can be gauged by what would your thought be immediately of solitary confinement. This is what God brought to me this afternoon when I was preparing this. I had to ponder it. Would we immediately freak out as it being the most horrific thing that we could even think of? Or would the thought come into our minds, well, that would give me a wonderful opportunity to have more worship and more intercession. More listening time. More time to receive his mind and his heart for a lost and dying world. Tell the average Christian 
that God has spoken and that tomorrow is to be a day where we never come out of our rooms and we are alone completely with the Lord for, for 12 hours. Most Christians, after one or two hours, get antsy. Why? He's not the lover of their souls. You see, the answer to these questions start to reveal idolatry. If we, can, if we are not in a close, intimate relationship with him where he is the consuming passion of our life, then other things have become that. We'll go on. No, we won't. We won't go on to Joshua's next message. We'll go on to some other scriptures in God's word in relation to idolatry. First of all, we'll take a look at what a dictionary. No, it's not a dictionary. I remember it's what the Holy Spirit gave me when I asked him. What is an idol? I didn't look it up in a, in a dictionary. I sat before him and I said, what is an idol? And this is what he gave me. An idol is something or someone who takes a priority place in my life to the Lord Jesus Christ in my thinking, in my time, in my affection, in my loyalty, and in my obedience. What thrills us? Let's answer. Answer God. What thrills us? Must be something that thrills us. What excites us? Yes, an idol is something or someone who takes a priority place in my life to the Lord Jesus Christ in my thinking, in my time, in my affection, in my loyalty, and in my obedience. In other words, my steps of obedience relate only to what he thinks and what he wants as the first and priority consideration. If it's others, then that's an idol. What thrills us? What excites us? Now let's put two more words on the end of those two questions. What thrills us the most? Come on, there must be something. Are you stirring up the loins of your, girding up the loins of your mind and thinking? What excites us the most? What do we talk about the most? What have we talked about the most since we've been here? Friends, these are questions the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart to ask this afternoon. I'm merely the messenger girl to deliver what he showed me. What do we usually talk about the most when we're together? What are we planning to talk about the most when we're together? Have you noticed he, beautiful Jesus, exciting, wonderful, full of wonder, full of grace and glory, beautiful, pure, magnificent, exciting, fabulous, precious, tender, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb of God, the one who speaks and worlds are made and are held together by his spoken word. Doesn't often become a conversation piece. 
Kwai is his name. Mentioned and focused upon usually just before meetings, before someone speaks or before we have a program. We may not make him the center point for another 24 hours. Why? Worship is the antidote to idolatry. Worship should never be something that we just have a form that we go through or a, it's put into a time slot. We'll have 20 minutes or half an hour of worship or whatever it is. Worship should be an absolute way of life. That everything that we're doing should bring forth praise, thanksgiving to him. Our lives should be a demonstration of worship. That's another whole message that God has given me. Worshiping God by our lives. A life of obedience is a life of worship. Praise comes from a life of worship. Praise and worship are two different things. When did you last sit down with another spiritual leader and talk just about God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit? Have you ever had a conversation with another leader? This is leaders together. Where Jesus was the soul, that was the conversation piece. He was the center and you wanted to talk about him. How you loved him, why you loved him, how you'd proved him to be, what you long to know about him more, things maybe that you didn't understand about his character, things you yearn to know. What an interesting discipline it would be if we had a fast of talking about anybody else but Jesus. be absolutely wonderful to have a program where for the next hour that's all we did was talk about him. No other subject. Just talked about him. Just him. Our hearts would burn within us. I've asked and asked and asked and asked with intensity and fervency and desperate praying that God would show myself and you, all of us, the idolatry that we cannot see. Only the Holy Spirit can bring the revelation. I'm trusting him to do it. I want every particle of idolatry to be revealed to me. I know, I know by the witness of the Spirit of God deep within me that there is revelation yet to come. I want to see it. If our the answers to our questions, what thrills us the most, what excites us the most, what do we talk about the most, is not him and him alone, friends. We've got homework. I've got homework. I have patches of times when he is the only thing that is the most exciting thing in my being, but it's not consistent. Therefore, that's how I know there's some idolatry there. The first commandment, Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 34, 14, you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. How fabulous. How absolutely fabulous. 
that God has such an intense, devotional, heartthrob, romantic interest in you and me that he's jealous over us. And he'll go to all kinds of lengths to see that we and he have got our act together of an intimate love relationship. He's paid the ultimate price for us to be his bride. If you want to think of something heady, it's being the bride, part of the bride of Christ. Sharing with him in his glory, it staggers my imagination. I believe it. It's in the Bible. Sharing his glory. Sharing his glory. The glory that he had with the Father in the beginning. Ruling and reigning over nations. Sharing his power and authority and his glory. It can never happen with idolatry. He's not only preparing us as a people for the next phase that we happen to be coming into, which is a big one in our mission, but far beyond that, all this is just a means to prepare us to be his bride, ruling and reigning over nations. Do you know, we'll be, we would be very uncomfortable as his bride with idolatry. It wouldn't work. He's jealous. A bride cannot enjoy the bridegroom if the bride is unfaithful. And when we have idolatry, we're unfaithful to God. We have another love before him. The next thing God spoke to me about the purpose of our coming together was Joshua 24, verse 1. I didn't choose this order. This is the order he chose to speak. So I just take it. It's his outline. I have, I have missed one very important thing, and it was verse 16 of, of chapter 23, the last verse. Have a look at the kind of warning in its intensity and strength and implication if any form of idolatry was going to be considered and if devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ was not what they were going to have or to God. Listen, if you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. When I read that verse in relation to what we were doing in these two weeks, it wasn't hard to discern what the Spirit of God was saying to us as a mission. If you don't make my word the bottom line and the plumb line, based on my, my character and my ways, and my word, the standard, if you don't turn from everything other than heart devotion to me, if you don't make me the centerpiece with these new plans that I am giving you, not only will they not work, I'll cause them to crumble. I'll destroy them better not to start than be embarrassed before a world because it's a world vision he's giving us and the world will know. Chapter 24 Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges and officials of Israel and they presented themselves before God. 
picture of us at this time in the history of our mission. He reminds them, first of all, of God's great power over all the forces against him, exactly where he started with them before. He must have thought they hadn't really got the message. Otherwise, why would he do it straight away again? We always have to be reminded that when we start anything, it starts with God. And it's a reminder that it is his power that has brought us to the point where we are and is it's his power alone that will take us to where he's telling us to go. Verse 14, he calls them to a new standard of holiness. Now, many years ago, in fact, I was pondering, Lauren, the significance this afternoon of the fact that the very first time God gave me a message out of Joshua 24, it was right here in Lausanne, at a hotel golf, our hotel round the road, and it was for this mission, and it was in 1971. It was the second time that I came to speak in, uh, at a school of evangelism in YWAM under your leadership. The first was 1970, where I came and taught every morning, night and e morning and night for a whole month. If you don't think that's a marathon for the teacher and the students, well, I don't know what is. God's grace got us through. The next year was 1971, and I came and spoke for three weeks, morning and night. And it was in that time, in the, our hotel over here, that God opened up Joshua 24 to me and gave me what has become what I called my message of the place of no return. I suspect that was the message that Dar referred to on the opening night when she spoke, where she said she walked through the forest and she knew the exact spot where she said that's the place of no return. I knew what she meant. I remember at that time, uh, after the, giving the message that I will not give in fullness tonight, I will only give reference uh, to parts of it because of time's sake, but I remember that we, we put our names, we all came out the front and we had a big piece of paper and we wrote our names down and we pinned it up on the wall that we were coming to the place where we were going to say the answer will always be yes to anything God ever told us to do, regardless of what it was. It was the place of no turning back, never saying anything yet, but yes, to God. And I thought, how significant that 19 years later, here, right here, God, at, at another uh, launching pad into YWAM, God should turn us to Joshua chapter 24. Now, I need to tell you that so that we may get the, again, the impact of how God wants us to listen in order to obey as God wants us to obey that on the intercession morning, I think it was Saturday morning, wasn't it? Was that intercession morning or Friday? Whatever Friday, was it? Intercession morning, when um, I had shared uh, on the Thursday morning these scriptures. And then on Friday morning, we came in here and Lauren called us all to a morning of intercession. Wonderful morning, wasn't it? And... Uh, just as soon as Fred Market, where are you, Fred? Would you stand up there? Right at the back, Fred Market, right there. Uh, just as soon, thank you. When Fred came in and sat down, the Holy Spirit sovereignly spoke to him and turned him to uh, Joshua 23 and Joshua 24. He hadn't the faintest idea why. He read through and meditated on both these chapters. God gave him great light on them. And, and today, this very day, been holding on to them, he had forgotten that they were the two chapters, two of the chapters that God gave me that I had mentioned the day before that hadn't registered at all. So he didn't know there was any connection between me or between us or whatever. But he knew that God was speaking from these chapters. And today he came up here in line to share the hope business, you know, the, the hope thing we were in, uh, 
in relation to what God had shown him here. And he was the person at the front of the line that was stopped. And uh, Dr. Ted said, no more for today. And then he turned and he said to Lauren, my, he said, I've been holding the, an unfolding that God has given to us uh, from Joshua 23 and 24. And I feel I'm to tell you about it. Lauren said, you need to talk to Joy. That will be a marvelous confirmation to her. And Fred came and, and told me this afternoon about this, and I said, Fred, it's wonderful confirmation that God is speaking to us powerfully as a mission from these two chapters, but I don't want to hear what he's told you until after I have finished, and then you can confirm and you can, uh, or otherwise, or whatever, you tell me after the meeting. So I don't know what it is that God has told Fred, but if God would go to all these lengths, to say Joshua 23, 24, we'd better hear what he has to say. And think of the timing that he would release Fred to speak about it today, not having a clue in the world that I was being told by God to speak on these tonight. Verse 14, I'm not going to give the whole message that I gave 19 years ago, merely to look at some highlights now. Verse 14, God calls them to a new standard of holiness. Did you notice that when Dar spoke, Darlene spoke on Thursday night, that that was one of the powerful, of the many statements that she made? Did, who of you caught and really heard that? Don't put up your hand if you didn't. Let's have the fear of God here with 100% honesty. Those of you who caught it, when she said, I believe with all my heart, God is calling us as a mission to a new standard of holiness. Thank you. About a third of you, it registered deeply. Praise God for that many. I picked it up immediately knowing about this message and thank God for the confirmation that he had emphasized that to her strongly too. Verse 14. God commands them to repent of their idolatry and make a permanent choice against it. But before that, he says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. What does it mean to fear the Lord? It means to hate sin, to stand in awe of his holiness. And there's no way that we can ever serve God faithfully without a saturation of the fear of the Lord. Some of you got that, some of you didn't get it. I'm going to say it again. There is no way that we can serve God faithfully without a healthy dose of the fear of God. Now, we hear a lot about this kind of thing. Well, they've been out on the mission field for years, haven't seen a convert in five or ten years, but never mind their being faithful. And they go out to be faithful again. Not expecting any fruit as long as they're faithful. What is faithfulness? Faithfulness is being obedient to what God tells us to do. He, and he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He expects us to fish where the fish are and to catch them. Faithfulness is not just going through the motions of missionary service. Faithfulness is being obedient to God's priorities. He expects us all to be soul winners. Doesn't matter how much salt and light we're doing, he expects us to catch fish wherever we are, in whatever aspect we're in. He expects us to make his priorities on a daily basis our priorities. That's being faithful. Worshipping him as a way of life is being faithful. Having an effective time of in, in intercession every day is being faithful. It's fearing God. It's being obedient to one of his priorities. Having quality time in the word of God is being faithful. 
having a burdened heart, looking for the opportunities to witness to people, is being faithful. Being obedient to everything in detail he tells us to do, whether it's washing dishes or whatever it is, is being faithful. But obedience follows instruction. There's no such thing as general faithfulness. Jesus was, as son of man, was the ultimate in the, in the demonstration of faithfulness. And he never, ever did a, a general thing. Always a specific thing as a result of a specific thing he saw or heard the Father doing. We're only faithful to the degree we are obedient to God's priorities in our lives. And obedient to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. That's faithfulness. It comes from the fear of God. It means taking God very seriously. And he says, now we're to be that. And then immediately he says, okay, quit the idolatry. Put the two together. Lack of faithfulness, lack of obedience to reveal truth, lack, lack of obedience to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, is idolatry. It's meaning we, it means we have put ourselves on the throne and we're having our program. That's idolatry. It's incredible how it's idolatry seeps through the bloodstream and the, the warp and the weef of Christians' lives and be totally blind. I'm just being faithful. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are lifting the scales from off our eyes and showing us idolatry from your point of view. Please continue your deep work of revelation. I so need it. Thank you that you're showing it to me. Show it to us all. Spirit of revelation, Holy Spirit, come on. Keep revealing it to us till we see it from your perspective. All the hidden forms of it, the subtlety of it. Thank you that you are. Thank you that you will. He not only immediately calls them to repent of their idolatry, but to make a permanent choice against it. He says, either have undivided devotion to God or have devotion to whatever you choose to put before him. It's a strong ultimatum. You know, that's exactly what I believe God wants to bring us to. That we don't take this message with any gray in it. It's a message with an ultimatum. It's a challenge. Are we going to continue where he is not the center and the focus and the center point of our lives? We'll only be collectively, friends, what we are individually. Correct? If we're content to have so little place for just him, personally. It won't occur to us to give him the center place always. Now, some collectively, some of you are already thinking, and I'm glad you are. That's wonderful. It's healthy. How in the world is this going to be put into practice? What happens when we all get into our groups from Thursday through Sunday? How can Jesus be the centerpiece? Right? Who of you have already thought that? We've got about a quarter of the people thinking. That's wonderful. That's terrific. It's a pretty good average. Only man's above most times. What I'm saying is I'm glad that quarter of those who put the hand up have already related it to what we're going to be doing. Let me tell you what happened in my heart today. I'll just be extremely vulnerable and open. I've committed myself to be obedient to the prompting of the next thing the Holy Spirit told me to do. I told God that tonight, before I came up here tonight. And he said, be vulnerable. 
It's very vulnerable. There have been times throughout our days together when the strongest urge has welled up in my spirit with something that will have been shared or said up here and I've longed for us to stop and praise. I've even looked for an, a, an opportunity or thought, now, how can I get a signal through? Because I felt the Spirit of God was wanting us to stop and praise. It can be just some report of somebody saying something. Or in the middle of a panel sharing. It happened in the middle of the panel sharing. I was nearly bursting at one point here that we would stop and praise the Lord. I think it was when that precious soul from South America was giving us the story about that woman who'd been in witchcraft. Every fiber of my being wanted to shout the praises of God at the victory over the enemy. We didn't worship him then. We didn't give him the praise then. That was a mighty victory. That's just one little example. Many times we, we hear of God working or like the, the morning we had the panel here. I thought that was profound. Absolutely profound. I've been in YWAM since 1967. I haven't seen such a balance of truth from such a diversity of leaders come as that morning. I thought it was awesome. I wanted for us to stand up and praise and worship God for what he'd done to bring that kind of balance. I wanted to praise again when we had the little the circles on the board, which were the synthesis or the, the little succinct way of saying what took place here. I wanted to praise again that he was coordinating and putting it all together. Why do we, why do we just go on? See, he can be the centerpiece. We can stop and worship. I know a pastor of a large church who whenever anybody is used of God in the church, and this is a way of life without exception because I've watched him closely for years, when anyone is used of God in the pulpit and the people clap or start to clap, he immediately runs to the microphone, can't get there quick enough, and say, direct it to the Lord. He can't stand any clapping that would be, that where there would be any focus on the vessel. He's jealous for God to get the glory. There are not too many spiritual leaders like that, are there, who run to the microphone to lead the people that, the, that Jesus and only Jesus would get it. It's not a thing with him out of a habit. I see it out of the intense devotion of his heart to the Lord. He's jealous for the glory to go where it belongs. So... Every move of God's Spirit in any form, in any form, I watch this jealousy for God to get the glory. If there's a statement made of uh, God working in some way, he'll call that congregation immediately to worship. God's heart is soft toward us. It's a strong exhortation. How do I know? Because mine is. That's how I know. Mine is as soft as butter. And he's bringing it through me. There's nothing but liquid love in there to every single one of us as I'm speaking. He's not mad with us. I can feel it. I can feel his heart. He's not mad with us. He's sad with us. There's a vast difference. He's yearning over us. 
to make him the center point. point. If we will commit ourselves to making worship the way of life, he'll show us how to give him the glory and reflect it to him. It'll be natural. It won't be a forced thing. It'll be natural. We commit ourselves. He'll show us how. You see, friends, I know you can reason back with me and you can say, well, Joy, didn't you give him praise? Yes, I did. So I didn't have to be frustrated personally. But I sensed deep in my spirit he wanted us together to praise him. Is there anybody in this building at all where there is a register and witness of the Holy Spirit that what I'm saying is truth to us at this hour? Just anyone at all. Thank you. Majority. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Show us how to change, Lord Jesus. Just show us how to change. Thank you for the gentleness with which you're speaking to us. Thank you for the love with which you're just sharing your sadness, but you're not mad. I know you, I can feel you're not angry, just longing and yearning. Thank you for being like that. Thank you. Your goodness is leading us to repentance. Show us how to change till it becomes a spirit natural way of life to make you the center point and focus on you all the time. Thank you that you will show us in these next four days as we come together in our groups how to just stop and worship you how to just stop and listen to you, just to, to be sensitive to your presence in any way that you should want to speak. Give us a picture. Thank you that you're giving me this picture now. That tells me that this is what you want us to do. I see us in our groups. I see groups all over the place. And I see the Lord Jesus at our invitation only, standing right in the middle, looking into our eyes, turning around, looking into everyone's uh, eyes, because I see this, the, we're in circles in the picture in my mind. It's not in rows, we're in circles. And I see Jesus standing right in the middle and pivoting around and looking intensely into everyone's eyes with such love and longing and wanting us to have that picture of his being there at all times, every moment, and not letting us, um, he's, he's wanting us to not let the consciousness leave us of his presence right there so that that will help us if we keep the picture of him being in the, in the center that will help us to keep a sensitivity to be saying what now Jesus what now worship, intercession talk, listen something from your word just worship sing, what is it Jesus he will be the center point he will direct. I can hear him speaking back to me. Oh, joy. How I'm longing to minister to them. How I'm longing to meet their deepest needs. How I'm yearning to be the only explanation of what happens in these days. I have brought my children together to minister to them at a deep level. If they will be conscious of my presence, 
invite me to stand in their midst? I will direct. Jesus is now speaking clearly to me in relation to those who will lead the groups. And this is what he's saying. Don't be afraid. I will be in your literal midst at your invitation. I know exactly how to lead these groups. Manifest the humility of total submission to me. Picture my standing there amongst you. Listen to my voice in the simplicity of a child. I will tell you what to say. And if you don't hear anything, wait. I will test you in the waiting to see whether you want what I have to say or whether you want to go on for the sake of leading the group. I have things to say to you in your groups, ways to minister to you, ways to manifest myself to you, much revelation to give you, but the greatest revelation will be of myself. And from the revelation of myself, my plans will unfold. Seek me as the priority, not the plans. Seek my face, not my hand. Seek to know me. Seek to want to be closer to me. Make me the heart throb. of these days together. <clears throat> Come with your alabaster boxes and break them at my feet. You don't understand what that means now, but in those four days or whatever it is, you will know what that is. You will know I will be asking you to give me lavish devotion and there will be cost. But my rewards, the way I will honor you as I honored those who broke it at my feet, will be more than reward for you. My main purpose in bringing you together in these groups is to see me, to understand me, to love me, to worship me, to listen to me, to obey me, to flow with the program that I will bring to you. It will not be difficult, but there will be testing times. You wait upon the I am who cannot fail you. I will manifest myself to you. The Holy Spirit has immediately brought a picture to my mind. This time it is a memory. It's obviously to encourage us. The, the memory is in our home in 36 Aldersgate Road, New Zealand. The picture is our living room. 
It's exactly 12 o'clock at night. It's a Friday night. There are leaders all around in that room. We have been together since 7.30 in the evening, waiting on God. It's spiritual leaders from all different missionary organizations, denominations, a cross-section of spiritual leaders in the city of Auckland. It's about, oh, I don't know, 25 years ago. Possibly more, but about that. It's midnight. The picture is as vivid to me now as it was 25 years ago. I can see exactly the people, the circle. I can see David Jacobson, a Baptist minister. I see in the center the coffee table with the, the bread and the wine. The Baptist minister has his eyes open and he's talking to the living Christ who is standing in our midst. And in reverential awe, but wonderful intimacy, he's talking to Jesus. And I remember, as though it were a second ago, the incredible closeness of the living Christ that was manifest around the breaking of the bread in that circle of leaders in our home. I have never felt the presence of the Lord Jesus more tangibly in all my life. It was awesome. I remember opening my eyes while David Jacobson was talking to the Lord Jesus before breaking the bread and handing it round, thinking, for sure, any minute I'm going to see him literally. His presence was so close. And then I sensed, I didn't see with my physical eyes, but I sensed the Lord Jesus literally walking around every single one of us. And I knew by the Spirit when he was at this one and when he'd gone to that one. And yet I couldn't see it physically. And he was just touching quietly each one and ministering to them. As they, the rest, had their eyes closed. Just David had his open talking to Jesus. Oh, the manifest presence of the living Christ. And I was reminded at that time of the scripture, I will manifest myself to you in John. Friends, he brought me that picture again because that's what he wants to do with us. Why would he bring that flash of 25 years ago, coupled with the vision I saw of his standing in our midst? Will you be sensitive to Jesus in the middle who has the program? Will you do in principle like we did every second Friday night for three and a half years? We met as leaders like that. Usually we never broke up until 2.30 in the morning, Saturday morning. We'd start at 7.30, just waiting on God. We had no human leader. The Holy Spirit was our leader. We had no idea ever, ever how we were going to start, what God was going to do, who would do it, through, through whom, and when we would stop. He alone was the centerpiece. Oh, what memory. He may well say to you in your groups, now I want you to break bread. Will you be that flexible? He may say, I don't want you to discuss an agenda for the University of the Nations. Just wait on me. If you sit for an hour waiting on God, he'll reward you. He's got an agenda. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's going to stand, if you'll invite him to, in the middle of every group and tell us what to do. 
God was preparing us as leaders who have since gone all over the world. He was preparing us to lead in moves of God's Spirit. Ivor Davies, one of the leaders of the World Evangelization Crusade, one of the most godly, mature men that I've ever had anything to do with, said it was preparation for future revival. Preparing leaders for the outpouring of his spirit. You can't match Jesus' program. How amazing, how full of wonder that in the mes middle of a message on idolatry you should show us what you want to do for these groups. You are just are so exciting, so innovative, so wonderful. You, you just, I marvel at you. I worship you. Full of wonder, God. Praise you. Hallelujah. Worship him. Give him glory. Thank him. Praise your wonderful name. You're so unstereotyped. I never know what you're going to do next. You're so exciting. Praise you. We worship you. Beautiful God. Thank you for showing us that you want to minister to us and bless us and take us out of the mold stereotype ways. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. I can hear the Holy Spirit prophesying through me. I want, I want the universities of the nations to be places of of where I can just break through, where my program can be shown and revealed and done at any moment of time. I want them to be places where my people come together with an excitement and anticipation because it's not all cut and dried. I would manifest myself in my beauty and my glory and the excitingness of my being. The unpredictableness of my uh, innovative ways based upon my predictable character. I want to be able to break through amongst you for my glory and my glory alone. And there will be a high price to pay because you will be misunderstood by the people who want it cut and dried. But I want to find a people around the earth through whom I can do my thing for my glory, for my great name's sake. And this will be the thing that will att attract the unconverted because I will move in power, in, in my exciting ways. Exciting because I am not stereotyped. And I will have ways of expressing myself that you have not heard of or thought of before. But it requires the humility of a submitted will, an obedient will, the fear of God upon you, not being concerned of what men will say. It will mean the discipline of much waiting in my presence. Perhaps not knowing what one of your agendas will be. Oh, how I yearn to break through with a university of the ways of my spirit. I have prepared some of you for many, many years for this kind of responsibility through your ministry gifts. I yearn, I long 
that what I've taught you, you will have the humility to apply in this University of the Nations. Again, I would say, a university of the ways of the Spirit. testing you at this foundation time. And your response depends upon what, upon what next I can show you. Friends, in prophecy, Two things. When God speaks in prophecy, it's to be judged. The Bible says so. The second thing is if it's confirmed by those in spiritual leadership, it needs to be responded to. I submit. for testing what has just come forth from me because I yearn, I myself yearn to respond to God but I must do it the Bible way Lauren has affirmed that this was a message from God and now I can lead you from that confirmation. I just want to give you my response immediately, Father. Thank you. Thank you. I personally find it awesome and full of wonder. But it makes so much sense. And how I know it wasn't for me is the whole thing is an amazement to me. And it's all a, as a surprise to me. It always is. There's always that element of surprise when you speak to me. And I say, my God, I leap to say to you, I want to respond in full obedience. And I have never been so excited it's a long, long time over a vision of what you've just spoken. And I say, God, thank you for showing me so vividly through that prophecy some of the wonder of what you want to do. I see nations coming into the kingdom, flocking in because God is so exciting in the midst. Innovative, creative, Everybody on the tiptoe of expectancy, hardly knowing what you're going to do next, like we always were in those Friday night meetings. Oh God, I worship you. This is 10 trillion times more exciting than anything we've ever had presented to this moment of time. This is a glimpse into what you do, want to do to break through the molds of the ways of men. To give training, schools, universities of the ways of the Spirit. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. That people may flock with the excitement of the tiptoe of expectancy 
to know how you'll break through now. How full of wonder. I worship you. I take the price. Of course we'll be misunderstood. What privilege. Anybody else who's heard God, captured the vision, is committed in the will to be part of this? Do you want to stand? I'm standing. I can hear him speaking again. I'm not looking to see who stood. You're standing for him, but I can hear him speaking in relation to your response. I am exciting. Far more exciting than most of my people will ever give me the opportunity to reveal myself. The ultimate of my excitingness is only revealed to those who choose to be nothing that I may be everything at every moment. I am the God who breaks through. Look at me from the word. Look at me breaking through. I have the stronger sense that he's saying, think of me breaking through in divine intervention in ways that the people had no idea. Okay, let's think of it. I'm responding because he said, think of the way I break through, so I'm doing it. Are you thinking of the way he broke through when there was no way? Parting the Red Sea, holding back the waters. Let's think. Are we thinking? You see, they, the priests had to do a dumb thing in the natural, just stand and go and put their feet in the water. But he broke through because they were prepared to be nothing. The most unmilitary-like thing that they could ever do was go and stand in the water's edge. At that moment, will we be nothing that he may be everything? He's, he's speaking to me clearly and saying, I want to break through in your midst as a mission and demonstrate my power and my glory and ways that you have never heard of or thought of before to reveal myself to a people who will be nothing that I may be everything. For this university of the ways of my spirit to be revealed, that people may see me as I am the great I am. In all my glory, my beauty, my power, my wisdom, my might, my faithfulness. I am. I am. I am. I will be. I will demonstrate. I am in your midst. Awesome power. Exciting things. Amazing vistas of truth and revelation to reveal more of myself. Awesome God again. I just worship you. I worship you. I worship you for this whole new dimension. I worship you. I praise you. I stand in awe of you. But I can see it. Vision. Thank you. Thank you that you're ruining us for the ordinary. Now I can hear God speaking to me personally. He said, Joy, you're walking on the water. You don't know one thing. Next. And you're out there walking on the water just obeying me. But I want demonstrations of this. 
Not in this little closed people group here, but in bigger groups. Now I can hear him saying to you, he's asking me to challenge you, will you live like this, choosing moment by moment to be nothing that he may be everything? Will you choose to live in obedience to God's priorities as your priorities? Will you seek God, to know God for God in intimate friendship? Will you study his word to know his ways so that you are comfortable when he breaks through in unusual ways because you understand the ways of the Spirit? So that you can lead others Do you really want, do you really want to live like Jesus? As son of man, he did not know. As son of man, by choice, he did not know what next thing the father would say or do. And he had to wait. Did the father fail? No. And Jesus won't fail us. There's an excitement in walking on the water. And while ever we're looking up with hearts full of worship, it's not scary. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, precious Jesus, for speaking to us. Thank you for breaking through. I understand now the burden that you placed upon my heart for days and days that you just break through and that we'd see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. You don't burden us and, and <coughs> not fulfill us. Thank you, Jesus. Beautiful Jesus. Worship him. Worship him. He's full of wonder. Worship him. Just look at him. I don't know what he's going to do next, but never mind. Just worship him. We worship you. All self-consciousness self goes when we're totally God-conscious. Be God-conscious. We worship you. Beautiful Lord Jesus. Full of light. Full of glory. Full of wonder. You're, you're the God of all wonder tonight. I feel like Alice in Wonderland. But it's in God's land. Be little children, little boys, little girls. Worship this God full of wonder. We worship you. We praise you. We adore you. We can see our idolatry going as we just make you the centerpiece. Glorious Lord Jesus, praise your name. Hallelujah. Full of light. Praise your name. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Lord Jesus. You are so wonderful. You are so glorious. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, we praise your name, we magnify your name, we give you glory, we praise you and give you the love of our hearts, we magnify you, 
we praise you, Lord. We glorify your name. We magnify you, Lord. You are so precious. You are so beautiful. You are so wonderful. We glorify, we glorify your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Whatever he tells you to do, do it. I delight in the idols that have been laid down tonight, and that I may take and sit 